Most of us who have ever had a relationship have fallen in love, and most of us have also had someone not love us back. But what if you're with someone who wants to be with you and loves you, but they say they don't feel in love with you? What does this mean? And is there ever hope that their feelings will change? My letter today is from a, a woman I'll call Kayla, and she writes, Dear Fairy, my boyfriend loves me, but is not in love with me. This is what he admitted to me after what was supposed to be our Valentine's Day date. Oh, all right, I've got my fairy pencil. I'm going to circle things I want to come back to on a second reading, but let's see what's going on with Kayla here. We've been together just over a year, reconnecting some years after college. We met studying abroad and traveled the world together, having an unforgettable time. The romance was short-lived, however, because we were young and needed to remain unattached so we could focus on our futures. Because we remained friends, it was not difficult to rekindle the bond. In fact, I had always had it in the back of my head that he was the one. Needless to say, I was over the moon when he expressed interest. He made big promises to sweep me off my feet, and I eagerly jumped right in. In the time that we were apart, I had explored other relationships and had even fallen in love. He, on the other hand, could not say that he'd built any strong attachments in his dating life. He even told me that after two years with his ex-girlfriend, he broke it off because he did not love her. I asked him why it took so long to figure it out, and he could not really say why. Huh? In our relationship, we struggled to feel connected. For the better part of it, we've been long distance, seeing each other once a month and speaking on the phone daily. A few months back, I moved to the same city and we entered a new stage of our relationship. All the while, I brought up concerns about feeling disconnected, uh, wanting more quality time and needing reassurance and thoughtfulness in order to feel loved. Most of these issues appeared small at first. For instance, he spends a lot of time on his phone. I would point out that given the distance and lack of time we had together, it didn't make sense for him to be more absorbed in his phone than in being present and engaged. But I can honestly say that these complaints seemed to fall on deaf ears, and over time, my bids for connection dwindled, and I became resigned to spending time with someone who was more interested in his phone than he was with me. Another issue is what I felt was his lack of consideration and thoughtfulness. Sometimes the instances of selfishness on his part were glaring and baffling. The latest fight we had on the topic happened after I worked a full day on a nearly empty stomach while he warmed himself food and offered me none. He had come over and I was so busy with a work assignment I had no time to cook. Even though I worked from home, I was so stressed out, I only had time to grab quick snacks throughout the day. By the time I ordered dinner for the two of us, he had already warmed up his own food and offered me none. When I complained, he expressed annoyance and said that he was frustrated at constantly being expected to roll out the red carpet for me. Needless to say, I was hurt. In the last few months, I've had to constantly ask him to spend time together. He was often traveling or unavailable due to plans with his friends. The most egregious example was when I went to his house for the weekend and he remembered that same evening that he'd made plans. So he left me and went out to a friend's party. It seems he was constantly prioritizing his friendships over our relationship instead of finding a balance. Even this past weekend, what was supposed to be our Valentine's Day celebration was split with his friends. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing because I've had this happen to me. <laughs> he told me the day of our date that he would be leaving early the next day to see his friends and would be busy watching the Super Bowl on Sunday. But the real kiss of death came when, he, when discussing the possibility of meeting my family, and he admitted not being in love with me, despite loving me. This sent me into a tailspin and absolutely gutted me. He asked that we seek therapy, and I'm skeptical that it will do any good. I love him, and he doesn't seem to share the feelings I have for him. I have been vulnerable and open with him every step of the way. I have disclosed my history of sexual abuse to him, and even when his response was lackluster because he returned to scrolling on his phone shortly thereafter, I kept showing up entirely vulnerable. Now I feel there is nothing more to do, but he is insisting on talking to me even after I asked for space. He now recognizes that he needs therapy, however, which he'd always denied when I suggested it. 
he has told me the reason he doesn't know how to be vulnerable is because it wasn't modeled for him. His father is an alcoholic who left his mother to raise him and his brothers alone, but he says he doesn't want to dwell on negative feelings toward his father and simply wants to move on. When talking about his feelings, he's never able to use I and always says you. For example, yes, sometimes you get angry, but, but you can't dwell on it or something to that effect. I know what you're talking about. I don't know what to make of this, but it is deeply unsettling and makes me feel like he is completely out of touch with his emotions. Uh, that's called ilyism, by, by the way, and it's always put me off when people do it too, and it strikes me the same way, even though technically I did a little research on it, like what is it called, what is it? It's not considered a sign of anything. It's just a, a way that people talk, they say, but you know, your heart feels it. Now I'm at a crossroads. I have been in a dynamic of unrequited love before, and I'm afraid to cause any more damage to myself by sticking around. However, I'm wondering if there's any hope or chance that this is salvageable. If he admits to not being in love, can we really go on? Many thanks for your attention. All right, Kayla. Whoa, what a painful situation. So I want to go through a couple things that you told me and see if we can parse out, like, what the heck's going on here? You dated in college, you had this great travel thing, and the romance was short-lived. And I think that when you're in a short-lived, youthful romance, it's possible that neither party is in love, and it's forgiven, it's not expected, and then you parted ways. And then he started it about getting back together, so he had some draw. And I thought it was interesting that he had had a two-year relationship with somebody, he, had, he ended it because he wasn't in love, and then he got back in touch with you. So there was something important about you to him. And, you know, I would guess that he hoped that this would be more like a conventional relationship. He's never built any strong attachments in his dating life. That is telling. And he also has no insight why. So there's a couple reasons this could be happening, but let's just sort of look at the evidence first. Then um, you move to the same city. You were dating, so you move to the same city. That's a big investment in the relationship. Um, but interesting to me, Kayla, is that you moved there and he hadn't told you he was in love with you. And I, if you, you know, if, if I had, if, if I were asked for my opinion at the time, I would have said, don't even think of moving in with somebody who's not in love with you, who's not there yet. That would, that would be something that, well, you just moved to the same city. Even so, I realize that people really need to spend time together and hang out a lot to sort of test the waters of a relationship. So I understand. So you brought up concerns about feeling disconnected. As soon as you're around him more often, you still felt disconnected, and it sounds like it got more obvious. And you needed reassurance and thoughtfulness in order to feel loved. Totally normal, totally realistic. Um, most of these issues appeared small, like he spends a lot of time on his phone. Okay, that's a complaint a lot of us have about a lot of us, right? Is that sometimes when we're hanging out in person, we're not being present. So that's not necessarily pathological. It doesn't mean anything. It's kind of inconsiderate. It's something, you know, any of us who do it need to work on. I've, I've had to like make myself stop doing it so much. It's so seductive, that phone, you know, it just always seems like something interesting is about to happen. And I definitely notice how looking at my phone a lot affects my ability to focus and work in a steady way. And so I have to like really try to not do it, especially in the morning and the evening. But I, but I still do it. And um, so I was a little bit forgiving of that, but he wasn't present and engaged. And in light of everything, it's not great. And um, he didn't listen. And so you quit sort of trying. You didn't make bids for connection. And the fact that you use the word bids, I know you're aware of the Gottman method. And they, you know, that's for anybody listening. Um, the Gottman method has this kind of core idea that's been very popularized on social media, which I think is a good idea, which says that they, they can predict if a couple will stay together or not by how well they each respond to each other's bids for affection, like make a bid for affection, like, hey there, can I make you a cup of tea? Or how was your day? It's, it's a bid for attention or affection. And so if, if a partner just ignores all of those, it's a bad sign. But there are some reasons, there are some mitigating reasons why somebody is like that. We'll talk about that. So he felt like making dinner, or paying attention to your, you had a hard day, you needed some dinner, you were over there and he just ate his own thing. And he, it, it made him frustrated that he was expected to roll out the red carpet. 
So sometimes when I'm hearing the story of somebody who's not present here, they haven't told their side of the story, I can see their point of view that they're just like, I didn't know, I didn't, I wasn't part of your hard day. I just was hungry. I, I had some food. I ate it. I can see that, but I totally understand your feelings as well. You came to his house for the weekend, and then he remembered he had plans, and he went to a friend's party without you, which is odd. And then it did seem that he was constantly prioritizing friendships over the relationship. He seems a little clueless that it's like, it's, you know, just culturally, we all agree, like, yeah, if somebody comes to your house, you're supposed to prioritize them. It was supposed to be the Valentine's Day celebration, and he split it with his friends. Well, so... Yeah, I'm guessing, so if you were in college and you had time off, you're in your late 20s, yeah. No, maybe for maybe if you're in your teens or something, but splitting it with friends is, is odd and clueless. And it was important to you, which is the thing that he should have understood. And then the next day was Super Bowl Sunday, so he went off to his friends. So this way that you're not included with his friends is also a little concerning. And you haven't really said anything about why that is. It just seems like he doesn't get it. He's just like, do to do I'm my friends. The real kiss of death was when the possibility of meeting your family, he admitted not being in love with you. And so I totally understand being in a tailspin. You've been dating him for a couple years now. Was it, wait, was it a couple years? How long was it? Just a little over a year. Still, still, he's not in love. And, you know, you just don't know what to do. And so when you say he now recognizes that he needs therapy, I don't know about that. Some t okay, maybe. He's not here to explain what he means, right? Um, but sometimes when we're with somebody who's not loving us the way that we need to be loved, our, you know, we will sometimes try to fix the situation by hoping that if they would just go to therapy, the therapist can turn them into somebody who loves us. And I totally get that that could be the case, but it's kind of unlikely. And, um, you know, if I had a dollar for everybody who wrote a letter where they were trying to make somebody go to therapy so that they could love them properly, Sometimes I think if you're young and, well, if you're any age, if your relationship is relatively young and you're not getting loved the way you want, that is the information that dating is there to show you. Like, it doesn't feel good to be with this person. And there it is. It just doesn't feel good to be with them. He sounds like an okay guy, sort of odd, um, not totally prioritizing you, um, but it feels terrible for you. You, what you need in a relationship to feel happy is not there. He doesn't have it there. And so that's not necessarily because of a therapy thing. I thought, you know, well, here's what I'm wondering. I'm wondering if he's aromantic. Do you know what that is? Maybe you've already Googled it and, you know, tried to find like what is going on. But aromantic, some people, you know, it's a sexual and romantic orientation. Some people are asexual. Some people are sexual, but aromantic. They just don't fall in love. And they there are signs of that that could be like, you know, they don't make romantic gestures, they don't really get it, they're clueless about the need for love, and there's a lot of ways that what you're describing sounds like somebody who's aromantic. He, ha he has no history of having that kind of close attachment, and he doesn't seem to have insight about it, as if he's not really wired for it. Like, if you were wired to fall in love, I, I hate the word wired, there's no wires, you know, but I mean, if it was your nature, if it was just how you're, how you're made, what your nature is, is is to fall in love you will fall in love you'll fall in love with cartoon characters when you're a kid and somebody in fifth grade and somebody later you know it will happen it may or may not turn into a relationship but this this way that it doesn't happen and the way that he doesn't even have a reference point for understanding what's missing like somebody who who whose nature is to fall in love when it's missing they would probably be able to say about why that was it's like, well, I just didn't feel like we really connected or I didn't feel like we understood. Like you are feeling, right? You're made for it. I just wonder if he's made differently. And that's, that's going to be a tough road for anybody who tries to have a relationship with him unless they are similarly aligned. It's possible for people with all kinds of, you know, ways that they're made in this way to, to be happy and flourish, but probably not with somebody who's waiting for them to fall in love very, very rightly. So that could be something. The other thing is maybe he's avoidant, which would be a therapy thing, and he does have trauma. So yeah, you know, that could be connected to um, an avoidant thing where he can't access his feelings. And I do know of success stories, um, rare but real, of success stories with couples where one partner really couldn't access their love at first and then they did. 
sometimes it took a something to shake them up a little bit, you know, where they maybe thought they were losing the person or something. I'm not encouraging you to make a threat you don't intend to carry out here. The avoidance does show up in that thing he said where when he used to say, I don't I don't need to work on this. I don't want to have bad feelings towards the, my dad who abused me. You just got to move on. You know, that's a certain kind of attitude towards trauma. And the thing about it is, is when people are there, that's kind of where they that's their safe place. So it's a little dangerous to push them and say, you're doing it wrong. You can't have this attitude. You need to go to therapy. If he feels that he needs to go to therapy and he wants both of you to go to therapy, um, first of all, of course, he can go if he feels like he should. If he wants both of you to go, it sounds like he's trying to save the relationship. And I really just leave it up to you if you feel that you can do this. I, I would totally support you to go do some couples counseling and just see if you can understand this better. Um, and sometimes it helps to have a third party in the room. Um, but if you felt like there's just no way that you want to be in a relationship where you're left in so much doubt about it, that's okay, too. You get to follow your heart. I wish you the best, Kayla. T this is a tough situation, and there's kind of no way through it without some pain. Such is life. Now, if anybody watching this wants to start to visualize and get clear about what a great partner looks like and start to, you know, craft your vision of what you really need, I have a download. It's free, and it's signs of a great partner. You can download it right there, and I will see you very soon. <music>